One of the greatest obstacles to crafting health and wellness is identifying and controlling inflammation. It's at the core of all complex and chronic diseases, and it's the driving mechanism that underlies the most common symptoms that people like you struggle to overcome. Join us as we explore cutting-edge science and research to give you the information and tools you need to create the quality of life you want and deserve. And now, here is the host of Inflammation Nation, Dr. Stephen Noseworthy. Hey there, it's Dr. Noseworthy, and we're back for episode 78 in the Inflammation Nation podcast. And I apologize if the sound quality isn't the greatest. I'm traveling on the road and recording this in my hotel room in San Francisco, so I'm just using my regular Apple AirPods and microphone. So again, my apologies if quality isn't what it normally is. Um, so we're continuing on the discussion now. We're, we're actually at the second obstacle to fat loss or weight loss. And that is the thyroid. In the last one, we talked about blood sugar patterns. And, and I'm not going to review that. You can go back and listen to that um, if you feel like you need to. Um, and to be honest, like the thyroid system is a little more complicated than we can deal with in a, a mini series that's really dedicated to the topic of weight loss. Um, we'll cover the essentials and it might take a couple of episodes to do that. And let's just start with how your thyroid controls your basal metabolic rate. And if you recall, we, re we defined that in the beginning of the series where we talked about the basal metabolic rate is basically your metabolic rate when you're sitting around doing nothing. It's basically your survival uh, baseline activity metabolic rate. And that doesn't account for energy that you would expend puttering around the house and the garden at work or exercising and that kind of stuff. And essentially what we're talking about when we talk about the basal metabolic rate is essentially the biological activity of every cell in your body, which is determined by the degree of thyroid stimulation that they receive. And so we can truly and accurately state that thyroid hormones are responsible for basic metabolism. And, but to be honest, there's a wide degree of variability in how much any individual person needs to have when we talk about something like normal metabolism, right? We, we might, for example, have two people who have the same level of thyroid hormones, but they may have radically different metabolic rates. And that's because having an adequate amount of thyroid hormones in circulation is only one of several variables that needs to be optimized for you to have reasonable metabolism. And remember that this thing called the metabolic rate, again, it's the number of calories you burn at rest just sitting there doing nothing, just existing. And estimates are that your basal metabolic rate or your BMR, which is tied to your thyroid sufficiency, accounts for about 70, 70 of your total daily energy expenditure. In other words, if weight loss is your goal, you absolutely must have an optimized thyroid. And this connection between your BMR and your thyroid is why hypothyroidism causes very common symptoms such as fatigue or weight gain. And these are two of the most common symptoms that show up in people with low thyroid that they complain about. And fatigue is very common simply because low thyroid hormone levels leads to lower energy production. And weight gain is very common because all other things being equal, a reduced basal metabolic rate means that you, if you eat the same amount of calories, but you burn less throughout the day, essentially you're putting yourself into what we would consider a calorie surplus. So let's talk about where low thyroid symptoms actually come from. And you might think that that's a silly question because low thyroid symptoms must come from having low thyroid hormones, right? Well, not so fast because, um, let me say it this way, a few years ago, one of the past presidents of the American Thyroid Association in the U.S. was quoted as saying something to the effect, and I am paraphrasing here, but, but the essential message is the same, but he was quoted as saying something to the effect of, Despite being on thyroid medications and having normal thyroid labs, particularly a normal TSH, about 50% of the women who are on thyroid medication with hypothyroidism still have unresolved thyroid symptoms, and we don't know why. And that's a shame because I know why. I know many people who know why. It's all based on physiology and, as we'll get to in a second, uh, the immune system and autoimmunity. 
But again, when we talk about unresolved thyroid symptoms, I, I think that, you, well, you might not be amazed because you might be in this boat. You might be someone on thyroid meds with unresolved thyroid symptoms. But we're talking about classic thyroid symptoms of fatigue or weight gain or hair loss or needing more sleep to function or even just poor sleep patterns, brain fog, depression, dry skin, cold intolerance, like cold hands and feet and so on. And so I guess the question comes down to like, how is it possible to have unresolved thyroid symptoms despite having normal thyroid blood tests and theoretically having normal circulating thyroid hormones in your body? And, and the answer to that is potentially twofold. And the first one is to recognize that all of these things that we call low thyroid symptoms are not really essentially or necessarily unique to the thyroid. They overlap with other symptoms. So for example, fatigue is not only caused by low thyroid. It can be from blood sugar. It can be from uh, adrenal and cortisol issues. There's any number of things that, that can contribute to fatigue. And likewise, weight gain, poor sleep, brain fog, all these things are not unique to the thyroid. And in fact, you know, in the last episode when we talked about blood sugar patterns, we talked about high blood sugar, insulin resistance, and the pathway that leads to metabolic syndrome and ultimately type 2 diabetes. That whole mechanism is considered to be, it's called the great thyroid mimic because it creates all the same symptoms. And so when I teach uh, either blood chemistry analysis or any of the thyroid seminars, we tell people if it, if it looks and sounds like thyroid, but it's not thyroid, it's probably blood sugar. I mean, that's how common they are. And, and quite often they go together. There's a very high percentage of women who have low thyroid. And I keep saying women, but that doesn't mean men don't get it. It's just statistically, it's mostly women. Um, although I would have to say that that's been changing over the last 15, 15 years or so. Um, but you, again, you'd be surprised at how many people with thyroid conditions have blood sugar as well. One came before the other, they showed at the same time. There's any number of different patterns, but they, they often co-relate. But, you know, in, in this case, if, if we can rule out other causes of fatigue, other causes of weight gain, which is easy to do with the right analysis, the right lab work, and, et cetera, then we're left with the following question that I just posed a moment ago, which is, you know, where in the thyroid system does thyroid function actually happen? Where do the symptoms come from? So where does function come from? And where does low, low thyroid symptomatology, how does it go wrong? How does this show up? And, and to be honest, the answer might surprise you. Because the entire medical community is focused on one thing, and that is how much thyroid hormones are you making or are you not making, with the rule being if you make less than you need, you are hypothyroid and you need to take it. And I may not disagree with that as a general statement. Um, let me state it this way. If you, if you make less than you need, then you're low thyroid. If you make more than you need, then you are high thyroid. We're not going to talk about hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease. That's just not relevant to the context of, of weight loss. In fact, that's usually the opposite. People with high thyroid and Graves' disease typically can't put weight on. But that's relatively rare, especially in comparison to low thyroid. But, you know, if a conventional doctor sees low thyroid hormones on labs and a high TSH particularly, then their automatic response, because this is how they think and how they're trained, is, well, here's your hot thyroid hormone replacement, full stop. That's the end of the discussion. And the only question beyond that is, do you need more or less than whatever the initial dose that they recommend for you, which is why you have to go back periodically to get your levels tested to see if they need to adjust the amount of thyroid hormones that you take. And we're not, at this point, we're not even talking about whether or not synthetic T4 is your best option and what about bioidentical combinations like Armour or NatureThroid or WestThroid and so on, and, and that might be a relevant discussion at some point. But the assumption is that if you give somebody enough thyroid meds to make their TSH go down to normal, and quite often it goes way below that, almost to zero in some cases, then everything should be fine. And, but that's certainly not the experience of half or so of the people who approach things this way, where the only thing they're concerned about is taking enough medication to replace what you're not making and to normalize your TSH primarily. And I know other docs might measure T4, some get really fancy and then measure free T4, but to be honest, the, the, the story and the thyroid system is more complicated than even just that. So 
you know, just because you have enough thyroid hormones in your blood does not mean that you're going to get the right response from your cells. Or to say it another way, just because you have enough thyroid hormones in your blood doesn't mean that you're going to resolve all your symptoms. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, at the cellular level is where thyroid hormone activity takes place. Therefore, thyroid symptoms come from a lack of cellular response to thyroid hormones. Now, here's an analogy. And analogies are imperfect, especially if I make them up on the fly. But, you know, let's, let's say that you're talking to a deaf person and they can't read lips they don't have hearing aids, and you don't know sign language, assuming that they do. No matter how much you shout at them, no matter which language you try to speak to them, or how you change your tone of voice, the problem is not that you are not communicating. The problem is they can't hear you no matter what you do. And that's the same potential issue with your thyroid. In order to have the basal metabolic rate that you need to burn enough calories throughout the day to prevent weight gain or to promote weight loss, depending on what your goal is, you need your cells to be listening to the language and the message of your thyroid, which is conveyed through hormones. And as I said a moment ago, if you didn't catch it, and this bears repeating, ultimately low thyroid symptoms come from less than optimal stimulation of your cells, the metabolic machinery that makes the cells do what the cells are designed to do. And now that might be because you're not making enough thyroid hormones, but there are at least two other mechanisms or ways to get to the same place. And so give me a moment to explain that. When I teach about the thyroid in my functional medicine seminars, like to other docs. We, we start with this big idea first, that you can take the entire thyroid system and you can break it down into three different subsystems or subsections or subcategories, however you want to say it. And the first subsection of the entire thyroid system, and this is where almost every doctor is focused, is the system that produces thyroid hormones, like the stuff that goes on inside your thyroid gland resulting in the production of thyroid hormones. And, and this is usually where the problem is if you get formally diagnosed with hypothyroidism through proper blood testing and then get put on thyroid meds. And for sure, low thyroid hormones create low thyroid symptoms because there's not enough thyroid hormones to adequately stimulate and run all the cells, all the systems, and all the functions of your body at full capacity. So production problems certainly create thyroid symptoms, but the reason why is because you get a lack of cellular stimulation. But there are two other subsystems or subcategories of subsections that can create the exact same symptoms that have nothing to do with how much thyroid hormones you make or take if you are using thyroid medications. And, and they are your hormone processing system. And another subsystem, which with a fancy word, that's called the proteomic system or proteomic response, which I'll define here in a moment. And I, I want you to think of these subsystems as being interlinked and sequential. And here's the, how this works. And again, this is very high level stuff, right? Very big general concept. First, your body or your thyroid produces thyroid hormones. And then those thy thyroid hormones that just were produced get processed, mostly by your liver, and converted from one type of hormone to another, essentially from inactive hormones to active hormones. And then finally, the thyroid hormones that you're just produced and processed into the active version have to interact with your cells, binding to a receptor that is unique to your thyroid hormones. But more importantly, <laughs> your cell has to respond. And in my prior analogy, you know, your cells are either deaf or they're not. And that might be a little bit too black and white, but hopefully you understand. Let me give you one more layer of detail for these three different subsystems that when I teach it and when I use it in my own clinical coaching practice, we talk about production, processing, and proteomics in that order. And ultimately at the end, like I've said several times, thyroid symptoms come from a lack of proteomic responses 
from your cell. So in hypothyroidism, when thyroid hor hormone production goes down, it, it's almost always caused by an autoimmune reaction called Hashimoto's. And when I say almost always, I mean like 90 plus percent of the time. There's not a textbook, a medical talk textbook on endocrinology with a chapter on, say, a thyroid. There's no um, medical review research articles on thyroid physiology that doesn't recognize the fact that almost every single case, at least in the industrialized developed world, um, there, there's that almost every single case is caused by Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. And, and quite honestly, I can literally talk about Hashimoto's for, for hours on end, um, probably for the rest of the year, to be honest. I, I wouldn't run out of things to say. But for now, know this. Whether you're MD tested you or not, if you've been diagnosed as hypothyroid and you're on thyroid medications of any kind, because you were at one time diagnosed as hypothyroidism, then it is almost certain that you have Hashimoto's autoimmunity against your thyroid. And quite simply what that means, if you don't know what autoimmunity means, is that your own immune system is attacking your own body. It's, it's treating your thyroid like it's an enemy, like it's, say, a virus or a bacteria, and it's trying to destroy it. And the target is actually the metabolic machinery inside your thyroid gland that produces thyroid hormones, which is why Hashimoto's leads to hypothyroidism because you end up destroying the very mechanism in cells that make these hormones that run the show. They run every cell, every function. But that's a production issue. That's the very first part of your system or the first subsystem of the entire system. But independent of any errors of production, most of those being caused by autoimmunity, now we have processing, which is the next subcategory. And, and once you have thyroid hormones in your bloodstream, they have to be converted into the biologically active form to have an impact on your cells, which for the purpose of this discussion is really about supporting healthy metabolism and the burning of fat as a fuel source. And that, again, is the processing subsection that we talked about. And why this is important is because when your thyroid gland produces thyroid hormones, it makes predominantly biologically inactive hormones, T4 specifically. But T4, while it has a very small capacity to stimulate your cells, it certainly doesn't do it to any great extent and not to the same extent that the T3 hormone does. And so the processing system is predominantly designed to take the T4 that your gland produces, your thyroid gland, and process it or convert it into biologically active T3, which does pretty much all the heavy lifting the stimulation of these proteomic responses at the cellular level that makes stuff happen. And so the T4 that you make or the T4 that you take if you're on thyroid medications is really just a precursor, an inactive precursor to the active T3 that does the job. It prevents your thyroid symptoms by stimulating your cells. And if something interferes with the processing of T4 and the conversion of that into the active T3 form, then you get the exact same symptoms as if you didn't make enough or weren't taking enough through your prescriptions. The symptoms are the same. It doesn't matter if you're not making it, not taking enough, or if you're not processing. The end result is we lack efficient and effective and optimal stimulation of cells through all systems and tissues of the body. Again, at the end of the day, low thyroid symptoms boils down to not activating your cells in an efficient, effective, and optimal manner. And that leads me to the third subject, subsection, subsection or subsystem of the thyroid system, and that is these proteomic responses that I have referred to several times now. And the word proteomic simply refers to proteins. Proteomic research is the research of the function of proteins. But in the context of thyroid hormones and function, low thyroid symptoms come from a low proteomic response, which means that for whatever reason, your cells are not getting strong enough signals that they need to make to make the proteins that are involved in cellular function. And that might be a slightly different set of proteins if it's a brain cell versus a liver cell versus a hair cell versus a bone cell. But the principle is all the same. 
And these, these proteins are used and involved in, well, let's talk about Let's talk about the net result of proteomic responses. It basically is the production of energy in all of your cells, hence the tie into your basal metabolic rate. It's involved in these proteomic responses result in the production of proteins that are used to repair damage to cells, to make signaling molecules, to make hormones, to make immune chemicals, to make enzymes. And the list just continues to go on and on and on. And so you can understand how important it is to have optimal thyroid function, not just because it helps fend off weight gain or lose weight if, if your thyroid is not efficient and optimal, but pretty much everything that's basic to the quality of life. So again, at the end of the day, the reasons that we want your thyroid gland to make enough hormones and to convert them properly from inactive T4 to active T3 is because we need that proteomic response from your cell. We need your cell making proteins that do all the things that your cell is designed to do. And, and so get this, if you don't produce enough T4, or if you don't take enough in medication form, then you get low thyroid symptoms because you don't have the right quantity of hormones to drive a good, robust proteomic response at the cellular level. But likewise, let's say you do have good production, or if you're on medications, you're taking enough. So it's not a production problem. But if your body doesn't process the T4 that you make or take efficiently into the active T3 form, you get exactly the same low thyroid symptoms because you don't have the right quality. It's not a quantity issue, it's a quality issue. You don't have the quality of hormones to drive a good, robust proteomic response at the cellular level, meaning you have more inactive hormones than active ones when processing goes wrong. But even if you have good production, or you're taking enough thyroid meds, even if you have good processing and you can efficiently convert inactive T4 into active T3, it is still possible to get low or poor proteomic responses at the cellular level and therefore low thyroid symptoms because other things outside the thyroid system can interfere with how your cells respond even when you have adequate amounts of active T3 available to your cells. And this, again, produces low thyroid symptoms, exactly the same as the others, because the quotient or the balance between the things that promote healthy function or things that interfere has been altered and is not optimal and efficient. Now, if I can backtrack to this analogy of trying to talk to a deaf person, let's change that a little bit. And let's say that the person that you're trying to talk to is not truly deaf, but they're simply hard of hearing. But maybe you're at a cocktail party, or maybe you're at a concert, um, and there's so much noise and confusion that they simply can't hear what you're saying. Something's getting in the way. You're communicating, they have the potential to hear, but they're sensitive to all this extraneous noise. But if you step outside, essentially removing the interference, all of a sudden they can hear you and your message gets through. That's the same thing with these poor proteomic responses. You can have normal production. You can have normal thyroid labs, whether you're taking medications or not. You can even have normal processing of precursor T4 into active T3. But if you have something else going on that changes how your cell responds to the adequate hormones you do have, then you're still going to get the same low thyroid symptoms. Hence, the explanation as to why at least half of women on thyroid medication still have unresolved thyroid symptoms despite having normal labs. That's why it's so important to work with somebody who understands your thyroid system in this way. And I say system intentionally because docs don't look at it that way. They, all they see is TSH, T4, do I up your meds or take them down? That's all they see. But here's the deal. Now that you know this, you know that production problems affect thyroid hormone quantity. You now know that processing problems affect thyroid hormone quality. And you also know that proteomic problems affect the quotient, the ratio or the balance between the things that support normal function and cell responses and those that interfere with it. In that sense, you know more about your thyroid than your doctor does. 
Now, next time, we're going to talk about two main things. We'll talk more specifically about how low thyroid states interferes with weight gain and fat loss or difficulties with fat loss. And we'll talk a little bit more about thyroid autoimmunity before we move on to the next priority or the next obstacle to weight loss. Hey, thanks for being there. Sorry about the sound. Uh, don't know what the quality is going to be like, but after I transcribe this and get ready to upload, I guess I'll see what the quality is. But either way, we'll see you next time on the Inflammation Nation. I'm Dr. Steve Noser. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to the Inflammation Nation. If you found this episode valuable, please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. Be the first to know when a new episode drops so that you can stay on top of your game. It also helps others like you find the answers they need. And why not head over to my main website, drnoseworthy.com, that's drnoseworthy.com, to explore my personalized functional medicine coaching programs, submit a question to the podcast, maybe take a quiz, or even reach out to me using the contact form that you can find there. We'll see you next time.